they are blessings in every way. For in my humble opinion, I know that we are only promised air and what to breathe and, and water to drink. Other than that, it's a blessing. Father, I ask that you be with the many that are sick. Give them strength and give them help again, if it be thy will. For we know all things are in your hand. Father, I ask that you always take in your, surround in your hand our service people, serving us, protecting us around this old world. Be with the law officers that are protecting us in our communities and be with the first response, the, the uh, ambulance people and stuff, to give them hope to help those that, that they have to help. Father, I ask you now to be with us here. Guide us through another one of the lessons of thy word. Always lead us in all that we do. Forgive us of our many sins. Please turn to number 105. Number 105, let's thank the Lord's Supper. It says, Power for the Lord's Supper. <coughs> when we meet in sweet communion, where the feast divine is spread, hearts are brought in close. Corinthians 11th chapter beginning in verse 23 for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said take ye this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me after the same manner also he took the cup and when he had supped saying this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Let's ask God to bless the, the bread. And shall we pray? Father, we come before your throne with this emblem of bread. We ask you to bless this because we know it's a symbol of your son's broken body upon the cross. We thank you for that sacrifice and the pain that he endured on that cross for us. In Jesus' name we pray. God, we come to your throne again, asking you to bless this fruit of the vine. This fruit of the vine to us represents the blood that your son shed on that cross. And we thank you for that blood that was shed on your son, that we can have hope of salvation if we follow your son's commandments. Go with us today. concludes the Lord's Supper. It's time that we remember that we receive all our blessings from God. As Brother Cheryl said, the water we drink and the air we breathe and everything else. And we, we thank, we want to thank God for all the blessings that he's blessed us with and help us to give back to today to God to show that we do love him. And I'm going to read the second Corinthian, Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. Every man according to as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Shall we pray? Please turn your song book to number 136. Let's sign this before the list. God should wipe the way all the people. When we reach the home and lay our burdens down, God shall wipe away.
appreciate it so much your presence with us this morning as we turn to the pages of God's Word and study another lesson of God's Word. Mark should be back with you uh, Wednesday. Uh, I don't know where he is. I tried to text him and he texted me back and said I can't get reception where I was. So he must be in some foreign land or uh, some planet other than earth, but he will be back Wednesday. You know, some of our dreams must remain dreams, for they can never become realities. For example, let's say that you've worked especially hard during the last six months. Life is a treadmill for you. You do nothing more than work, eat, and rest. You have no time for your wife or husband or your children, certainly no time for relaxation or recreation. Work hours are long. You go to work exhausted. You come home ready to drop. But in those few minutes that it takes you to go to work or return home from work, you dream. You dream of a very unusual vacation, of a getting away from it all. You picture yourself on an island of paradise doing nothing but resting, reading, golfing, Fishing. You picture yourself as taking it easy from morning till evening, away from work with nothing to do but fulfill your wishes. That dream is so real that you can see the shimmering ocean water rolling in across the shoreline. You can feel the warm kiss of sunlight on your face. This is only a dream. A dream that will always be a dream. 
and that warm kiss that you felt, well, that was just your dog licking you in the face. <laughs> to come true, such a dream would cost so much in time and money that it's beyond the reach of the average person. Maybe we tell ourselves when we dream dreams like this one, well, it's all right to dream such dreams, but I can't get serious about them because they never can be real. They belong to the world of make-believe. They don't belong to the real world. Is it possible that we must regard the possibility of becoming and being the Lord's church today as only a dream, which was, must always remain a dream. Are those outside the church as well as those within the church right when they say that this dream is impossible, that it just can't be real? Is this possibility so far removed from the real world, belonging instead to the world of make-believe? Or is the possibility of us being the Lord's church today a totally different kind of dream? One that we can realize and make come true. I submit to you that we can be the Lord's church today. But our being his church hinges upon three ifs. Now somebody has said there's a big if in the middle of life. Not only in the spelling of that word, but also in the living of it. This is especially true concerning being the Lord's church today. We, yes, we do see the pattern, the outline, the description, the portrayal of the New Testament church in Acts and, and the epistles of the New Testament. The New Testament scriptures are so clear regarding the Lord's church that no one has to entertain any thoughts about what it is and it was established. If we today can just respond positively to these three ifs, we will be assured that we can and should be the Lord's church today. But what are those three ifs? First, the Lord's church can exist today if our Savior, Jesus, can keep the promises he's made. Now, this if has to be considered because the church is simply nothing more than the group which has been saved by Jesus Christ. The Lord's church cannot be a reality unless it is created by him. The Lord's church belongs to Christ. It's created by Christ. It's sustained by Christ. The Lord's church belongs to Christ. Jesus said that he would build his church, Matthew 16, verse 17. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, said that Jesus had been exalted to the right hand of God, had received the promise of the Holy Spirit, and had poured forth the Holy Spirit, which had clothed the apostles with power to give God's revelation to the world. Acts 2, verse 33. When this first gospel sermon ended, following the death, burial, and 
uh, uh, resurrection and ascension was ended, 3,000 accepted that message and were baptized. Acts 2, verse 41. The church, which the prophets and Jesus had foretold, was established. Following that day of the beginning of the church, we read that the church was praising God and having, having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Acts 2, verse 47. Throughout Acts and the epistles, the church is pictured as being under Jesus' control. He added people to it when they obeyed his gospel. He dwelled within it, and he gave it growth as the church did his work. Now, in light of all these facts, the questions we must ask ourselves are these. Can Jesus add people to his church today? as he did in the first century. Can he sustain his church today, even as he did in New Testament times? When people obey his word today, as they did on the day of Pentecost, when the church began, will Jesus add them to his church? These are some questions we must ask and answer. Now, some of us senior citizens probably remember a TV program that was popular back in the 50s. That program was entitled The Millionaire. Each show presented a story about a multimillionaire named John Beresford Tipton who selected a special person and gave that person a million dollars anonymously. The heart of each story was how that gift of a million dollars changed the life of the recipient. Now, some, suppose someone came to you and said, you've been chosen to receive a million dollars. Here's the check. You can spend it any way you like. Well, what would be the first thing you did? After the initial shock wore off, the first question you would probably ask yourself would be, is this real? Or is it just a dream? The next thing you would probably most likely do would be verify the authenticity of this gift you probably would hurry first to the bank and attempt to cash this check. You would probably be asking yourself on the way to the bank, is the name on this check reliable? Can the person whose signature is on this check stand behind his promise? If it's a bank, you're told we can honor this check. The amount of one million dollars will be deposited into your account. Then you would know that all is well with this gift. That the gift is authentic because the giver is totally reliable and can be trusted implicitly. We actually face that same, that very question regarding the church. We must ask, is the one who gives life to the church and sustains the church reliable? Can I depend today upon Jesus to do what he promised he would do? Whether or not we can be the church of the New Testament today depends on the trustworthiness of Jesus. 
Now, should we have any doubt that Jesus would keep his promises? Shouldn't we be saying, well, if the existence of the church today depends on Jesus' credibility, I have absolute confidence that can we, be, we can be his church. I've never doubted Jesus. Being confident regarding our Lord's integrity and ability today, we should be able to answer yes to the question, can the Lord's church exist today? And not have to worry at all about the first if. Those who say that the Lord's church cannot exist today, as in New Testament times, simply do not have confidence and trust in our Lord. But the second if is the if of the seed. The Word of God is called the seed of the kingdom in Luke 8, verses 10 and 11. Now, if that seed is good today and will produce today what it produced in the first century, then we can be the Lord's church today. Jesus told his famous parable about a sower in Luke chapter 8. He said that the sower sowed his seed in broadcast fashion throughout a field. Some seed fell on stony ground. Some fell on pathways or hard surfaces. Some fell among thorns. Some fell on good soil. After telling this parable, Jesus gave the interpretation of it to his disciples. In Luke chapter 8, beginning at verse 9, we read these words. Then his disciples asked him, saying, What does this parable mean? And he said, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is given in parables, that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of our hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, who believe for a while, and in time of temptation, fall away. Now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. We know what Jesus intended to convey by this parable because of the interpretation he gave. He said that the seed that was sown was the word of God. And the souls were the different types of hearts of men. The brother of our Lord, James, likened the word to see. When he said in James 1, verse 21, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save you, to save your souls. 
In addition, Peter said to the Christians to whom he wrote in 1 Peter 1, verse 23, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. A fundamental teaching then of the New Testament is that the Word, the New Testament scriptures in this case, is the seed which when planted produces both Christians and the New Testament church. This characteristic of the New Testament scriptures forces us to ask this question concerning being the New Testament church today. Can we trust the seed, the New Testament scriptures, to produce today what they produced in the first century? Can we? I've read this illustration. Suppose you have a five acre field that you want to plant in wheat. You go to the seed store and purchase the seed to sow in your field. After tilling the ground and preparing the soil, you sow the seed that you have bought. However, as it begins to sprout and push tender blades through the soil, the soft soil, you become aware that Wheat is not coming up. Day after day, you watch your crop grow, but it's not a crop of wheat you're watching. It's a crop of cotton. Somehow, cotton was planted instead of wheat. You're dumbfounded by what's happened, and you begin to investigate. As you think about it, you conclude that there are only about four possibilities of what went wrong. First, you could have accidentally bought the wrong seed. You thought you picked out wheat seed, but unknowingly, you bought cotton seed. You thought, uh, second, the, the clerk at the seed store might have switched seed on you. You bought wheat seed but he slipped cotton seed into the sack instead. Third, someone sowed the field with cotton seed before you sowed it with wheat, and the cotton seed has sprouted before the wheat seed. Before us, you just thought it was cotton that came up, but in reality, it was wheat. But you couldn't tell the difference. One thing is certain in your mind. If wheat seed had been sown, then wheat would be coming up. You know that wheat seed will not produce cotton. And you are so sure of this truth that you won't even list this as a possibility of what went wrong. Now, we don't have to be farmers to know that seed will produce only after its kind. No one can point to a time in human history when wheat seed was planted and cotton plants came forth, or when watermelon seed was planted and grapes came forth. Seed, which is hundreds of years old, will only produce after its kind. As Paul said in a different context, whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Galatians 6, verse 7. Now, let's apply this truth to the church. When just the New Testament is planted in human hearts, only the New Testament church will result. The New Testament simply cannot produce anything else. The New Testament cannot produce a 
denomination. It can't produce the Baptist or Methodist or Catholic or any other denominational body. The only way for anything other than the New Testament church to come up is for something other than the New Testament seed to be sown in the hearts of men. If, therefore, the seed of the New Testament will produce today what it produced in the first century when sown in hearts, guess what? We can be the Lord's church today. To assure ourselves that only the New Testament church is being produced in us, we must make sure that only the New Testament seed is sown in our hearts. Why? Because God will uproot anything else that is planted in the name of religion. Jesus said in Matthew 15, verse 13, every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Well, only one more if remains. But this if is just as important, if not more important, than the first two. The third if in whether or not we can be the Lord's church today has to be the if of submission. Only if we are willing and determined to submit to the Lord's church completely in faith and obedience can we be the Lord's church today. Now, the New Testament is not like a famous painting that you look at and admire but never do anything about except hang it on the wall. The New Testament has to be absorbed and acted upon. It has to be followed and obeyed. Back in James, James wrote in chapter 1, verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. We become and we remain the New Testament church only through obedience to the Word of God. Peter said in 1 Peter 1 verse 22, Since you have purified yourselves, your souls, in obeying the truth through the Spirit, and sincere, sincere love of a brethren, have one another, love one another fervently with a pure heart. A true disciple, a member of the true New Testament church, <coughs> learns from Jesus and follows in his footsteps. He not only hears Jesus, but he also heeds him. Jesus told us in John. 15 verse 14 you are my friend if you do what I command you now we all have known people and know people now who pretend to be Christians they speak often of the scriptures they glibly use the Lord's name in every conversation they come to the worship every time the doors are open but their lives, their worship, their commitment indicate that they worship God only with their lips, not with their hearts. Their lives are missing the vital ingredient, ingredient of submission. Now we can look at the New Testament. We can talk piously about it. 
We can quote scripture, we can sing about it, and we can even be scholarly students of it and never really follow it. The book that tells us of God's love for us, the book that reveals the pattern for the Lord's church, the book that gives divine hope for eternity deserves only one response. And that response is obedience. Thus, no response will make us the New Testament church except the respond, response of submission. If we will submit to the New Testament scriptures, we can be the Lord's church. But this submission must be deep and abiding. We must become his followers his way. We must worship him as he directs. We must function as his spiritual body under his lordship. We must seek to fulfill his mission with our lives we, and conduct ourselves according to his example if we are going to be the Lord's church today. Does any doubt remain? If our Savior keeps his promises, if the seed of the kingdom, the New Testament scriptures, will produce just Christians as it did in the first century, if we will submit to the New Testament scriptures in faith and obedience, we can be the Lord's church today. A woman went into a museum one day to view some of the great masterpieces of the world. She looked momentarily at one painting and then blurted out, I don't see anything to that. Her remark was overheard by the custodian. He walked over her to her and said, Lady, that painting is not on trial. You are on trial. Like this lady, we too have been placed on trial. Jesus was once on trial, but his sincerity and truthfulness has long since been verified. He will keep his promises. He's the Lord of truth. The New Testament, a seed which will produce Christians, is no longer on trial. The word of the Lord lives and abides forever. 1 Peter 1, verse 25. It is the enduring, eternal truth of God. No, the only ones on trial are us. Are we going to be the church of the New Testament? Or are we just going to be another pretender? Will we open our hearts without any prejudice to the New Testament scriptures? Will we allow the Lord's word to mold us into his church? It has all come down to us. God has done his part. The Holy Spirit has done his part. Christ has done his part. What will we do to save you? and the seed of the kingdom. Will we submit to it? If we couple submission with the Savior and the seed, no doubt we can be the New Testament church today. But the decision is ours. The first step in submission to Christ in the New Testament is in obedience to the commands that he has given us to become a Christian. If you're outside of Christ this morning, we urge you to submit your will to his by believing in Jesus as the Son of God, by turning away from your sins and repentance, by confessing your faith in Christ, and by being buried with him in the waters of baptism, to have your sins washed away in his blood. If this is your situation, 
Or if as a Christian you've not been submitting to his will, you now have the opportunity to respond to heaven's invitation as we sing in a song of encouragement. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portal, he's waiting and watching, watching for you. Turn your song books to number 500. Let's sing the first verse of this, and we'll have our closing prayer. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it and Oh, God. 